Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in the uh, live session. Today I'm going to talk to about and take questions for inflammation and the role inflammation plays with uh, uh, immune health, immune uh, resilience, and so forth. For those of you guys that are new um, to um, my books or the webpage we have, uh, it's called Dr. K News, DRK News, NEWS, and I have articles on there. I also put together an immune resilience program. And in the Immune Resilience Program, we have, um, it's a free program. You can go online to Dr. K News, and it goes into some of the key things that are important for you to do uh, to support your immune resilience. So some of these things, let's make sure the videos are working. Hi. Hi, Dana. Uh, great. Thank you for joining. Um, so anyways, in this uh, Immune Resilience Program, we're going to go into lots of different things uh, related to um, how lifestyle and different factors like sleep, exercise, hydration really impact the immune system. It's really not about nutritional supplements, but just dietary lifestyle mechanisms that can really make an impact on your overall immunity. So thanks for everyone that's joining. Um, hello, Victoria. Hello, uh, Jean and Gabby. Thank you for, for being here. Um, so let me talk to you guys just as some general concepts about inflammation. So one of the things that we do know is that everyone has some degree of inflammation that they're dealing with. And when you're looking at the inflammatory cascade, um, when you, people that have lots of inflammation tend, tend to have lots of fatigue, uh, depression, and pain. And they just don't feel like moving and they don't feel like actually engaging in life. So one of the things that inflammation will do is that inflammation will sh uncouple a cellular mechanism that's called mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. And this is a mechanism in which your cells make energy, they make ATP. So one of the things that first happens when people start to have uh, lots of inflammation in their body is just the energy of moving their body, moving their limb, doing anything is just compromised. So they, re they really don't want to do anything. The other key thing that they notice is their joints may hurt, their body may hurt all the time. If they go out and exercise, it takes forever to recover. They may actually feel much worse after they exercise. They can't figure out how to do it. So those are all oral signs of, of, of significant inflammation throughout the body. Now, when inflammation hits the brain, inflammation in the brain uncouples, or not uncouples, but, but slows down nerve conduction. It's the speed of how nerves conduct. So what happens when people get inflammation in the brain is they get this... Uh, decreased speed of brain firing, so they get what's called brain fog, they just can't find the words, they have a hard time, um, uh, that's that's there, and uh, they have uh, some issues with, they have some issues with uh, depression, they can't focus, they can't think, they can't concentrate, so these are all some of the things that, that are there. Okay, now, um, when I take a look at this here, uh, you got some questions in here so hey Peter uh, hey all hey everyone thank you for joining again I'm just taking a look at some of the comments here so thank you so much for that and uh, we've got a few things going on but let me just talk to you about some, some more principles of inflammation as people join on when you're looking at the inflammatory cascade your inflammatory cascade is going to be triggered by two things one is one of the things that you'll see is that one of the key things about the inflammatory cascade is how much tr how much inflammatory triggers do you have and versus how much antioxidant and anti-inflammatory systems you've developed. So, for example, if you have lots of inflammatory triggers, so let's say you're sensitive to different food proteins. For example, the most common ones would be um, milk, milk protein for, for most people, albumin, egg protein, gluten, um, and soy. Those are the most common, and, and lectins. Lectins would be like nightshades or foods with seeds in them, um, like eggplant, tomato. Those are the most common foods people have an inflammatory reaction to when you just look at the population entirely. So when people have a chronic inflammatory cascade, if they're constantly eating those foods, let's say they don't know that they react to eggplant and tomato, and they have that uh, susceptibility for that inflammatory response, and they keep eating it, then, then there's a higher degree of inflammation there. Now, if their anti-inflammatory system is really healthy, then it can calm it down and they may not notice much. But for some people, what happens is the anti-inflammatory system wears out over time and then the inflammatory cascade becomes dominant. And that's when they get depression, brain fog, muscles hurt, joints hurt, everything hurts. They just basically feel old and worn out and tired. Now, when that inflammatory cascade hits, 
one of the things that happens is you get a depletion of your anti-inflammatory reserves. If you're constantly having an inflammatory response, now the inflammatory response can, can be from other things besides foods. You could have an inflammatory disease, you could have inflammatory bowel disease, or you could have an autoimmune disease, and there's just a dysregulation in the immune system that's causing inflammation. You could have um, pollutants, air pollution triggers inflammatory responses to, to people. You could have uh, various types of chemical exposures. So all these different types of triggers uh, can, can create an inflammatory cascade. We may have a susceptibility to one type of trigger versus other based on our genes. For example, if you have a, a celiac disease gene, then gluten is going to be a major source of inflammation. Um, if you have some, some upregulation of different, what are they called, gene types, LH, HLADQ gene types, it may not necessarily be genes, it might necessarily be gluten, but it could be other types of uh, underlying conditions that can really create an inflammatory cascade for you. So everyone has some uniqueness of their inflammatory cascade and what types of triggers and what types of responses that, that they can get. And now, um, when, when this inflammatory cascade gets upregulated, your antioxidant system has to calm this down. And your antioxidant system is really based on your body's ability to make an antioxidants. So. Um, eating foods very high in sulfur and flavonoids, basically colorful food is one of the key things, and sulfur smelling foods um, like garlic, onions, um, and then very high flavonoid foods like blueberries, pomegranate, um, cherries, raspberries, blueberries. These things all create these flavonoids and precursors for us to make our antioxidant systems work efficiently. And, uh, and what's interesting is when you look at the coronavirus, you know, every, like lots of shelves are empty for bad, unhealthy food, but the produce is usually pretty, pretty full. And, uh, you know, uh, the frozen berries and fruits in the freezer section are all full, but, but all the bad stuff is taken away. So I don't think people are really getting all their uh, flavonoids. But high degrees of flavonoids and, and high degrees of sulfur-containing foods really build your antioxidant system up. And then other things that have been shown to build the antioxidant system up are exercise. So when you exercise, and you put a stress on your body for performing, you actually get an initial inflammatory cascade while you're exercising, but then you get this huge antioxidant response after the exercise and even during the exercise that lasts for many, many hours, and then you start to build your antioxidant reserves. So for the most part, when you're looking at um, the inflammatory response, the inflammatory response, again, is a combination of how many triggers do you have or inflammatory, uh, and then how is your body's anti-inflammatory system responding to it, and if you have an inefficient antioxidant system and you're very pro-inflammatory system, then you're going to be constantly inflamed. And if you're constantly inflamed, you're going to have you know, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, joint pain, brain fog, uh, just going to feel like you can't function, you're going to feel old. Those are all the things that are involved with um, the chronic inflammation. Now this chronic inflammatory cascade is, is, is going to really determine many things. The, the more inflamed you are for the longer periods of your lifespan, the, the faster your brain neurodegenerates, the greater destruction you have to blood vessels, so all the negative aspects come down. Now, how does all that relate to immune function and immune resilience? Um, and one of the key things about that is that the anti-inflammatory system, your antioxidant system, isn't only there for you to um, block inflammation that can make your body hurt or not hurt and so forth, your antioxidant system is also a key part of your immune response. So when you have a pathogen like a virus or a bacteria or some kind of infection that comes into your body, your immune system has what are called two different responses. It's called that there's a Th1 response, T helper 1 response, and a Th2 response. And a T helper 1 response is your immune system's response to producing immune cells and natural killer cells and different types of uh, um, soldiers of the immune system to destroy the pathogen. And that all has to take place. And then your Th2 response is where B cells come in and make antibodies to find the pathogen better. But it's also where your antioxidant systems comes in and quenches and calms down the inflammatory destruction so it doesn't get out of hand. So one of the things that we know that's happening with people, for example, that are not surviving with the with, uh, coronavirus is that they have pre-existing inflammatory conditions and then they get into what's called a cytokine storm where their inflammatory system goes crazy they can't calm it down and then they get their lung barrier destroyed significantly and then leads into all the complications so one of the key things is that you know when you're looking at your immune system your antioxidant system your anti-inflammatory system is a key part in making sure your immune system is in check 
that it's not that it doesn't go into what's called the inflammatory cytokine storm or that cascade. So one of the key things is, you know, at this point, I think um, a lot of people are just focused in on with this pandemic is how do I how do I keep my immune system healthy? How do I keep my uh, you know immune system function best I can? So um, once again, in our if you go to Dr. K News, D R K N E W S dot com, we have the the free program to help everyone that's worried about this, but lifestyle called the Immune Resilience Program. It goes into those details about that. But then another thing to kind of add to that and talk about today is how important your overall inflammation is throughout the day. So if you're listening to this, just take a look back and just ask yourself, how do you feel? Do you feel totally inflamed? Does your body hurt? Um, is it hard for you to work out? Do you not recover after recovery? Do you have depression? Do you have brain fog? Those are all things that can promote the inflammatory cascade. With all the social isolations that are happening right now and people stuck at home and being depressed because they're not interacting with their friends and they're not in you know, social groups and, and those are such necessary parts of just human function, sometimes people are just eating really poorly and that eating really poorly is then causing inflammation and then they get tired and fatigued because the inflammation shuts down their energy producing cells and then they start to get even more depression and then as they create this inflammatory cascade, what they may not realize is that their immune resilience is now being compromised. So if you don't have a proper anti-inflammatory system, then um, what happens is that once the, if, an, if, you, or if you have an infection or dealing with an immune response, you have to be able to calm that system down. And if you're trying to calm that system down, your antioxidant reserves are critical for your ability uh, to do that. So I hope that helps. That gives you some ideas of what's important. And if you're trying to improve your immune resilience, um, you can try to look at your triggers, whether it's food, chemicals, uh, or other factors in your life. Maybe you're a smoker, and who knows what. And then look at how many antioxidants you're, you're consuming. Foods really high in berries and flavonoids. I mean, very high for foods really high in, in flavonoids or antioxidants, or you can eat superfoods. Then then you can really kind of support yourself. Let me take some questions. Um, I know I know a lot of you have asked some questions here, so let me do my best. I will admit I'm not very, I'm, not, I'm still having a very hard time reading questions and uh, answering, so I'll do my best. The only things I really can't answer is personalized medical questions that are very specific. Those, those are two, those are, um, just can't get enough information from a Facebook question to answer those. I can just answer general questions here. Okay. One of the questions I hear from, first one here is from Shem, Shemshed. I just started uh, taking 1.5 milligrams of low-dose naltrexone to help with lifelong constipation that has been very difficult to resolve. Should I start to come off it as soon as they start to get better or stay on it for a few months once they've improved? Does the colon become lazy for medications like this? Also, what is the best way to wean off the medication? Okay, well these med medication questions and personal uh, healthcare questions I really can't answer for you because I really don't know enough about your medical history or any or anything related to that. You really should talk to your, your prescribing physician about that. Now, one of the things that we'll talk about is lifelong constipation. One of the things that people don't understand is that you can end up with degeneration of the gut nervous system. There's a, a part of the nervous system called the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system is the nervous system for the gastrointestinal tract. And just as the brain degenerates, the enteric nervous system can degenerate. Now, things that can cause your intestinal... Uh, nervous system to degenerate um, or just chronic inflammation, <laughs> going back to that topic. So if someone has lifelong celiac disease and it took them 20 years to get diagnosed, they could have had significant inflammation causing degeneration of their nerve plexus in their gut. And the nerve plexus in the gut contract smooth muscles of the colon so you can have um, your, you know, your bowel movements uh, to have a proper um, timing. So when people get chronic inflammation in their gut, from chronic inflammatory diseases of the gut, there's a point where their intestinal tract actually degenerates, and when that happens, they just have constant uh, motility and constipation issues. So, you know, that's one thing to take to be a thought of. Then those things lead into something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because as they lose the ability to contract their smooth muscles of the gut to move food along, they also lose the ability to close the valve between the large and small intestine, and then bacteria from the large intestine moves into the small intestine and they get constant bloating and distension and so forth. So people that have chronic inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's ulcerative colitis or celiac disease or people that just have a significant amount of inflammation that's led into brain neurodegeneration 
typically end up with degeneration of their gut. And in those cases, there is really some degree of permanency, and you have to use things like stool softeners, like magnesium, and even coffee enemas, and different types of things to really improve that motility. So that's one thing to, to be aware of. So, you know, back to the topic of inflammation. If you have chronic intestinal inflammation, then you do have this increased risk for chronic to actually degenerate the gut. You know, some people think, oh, well, I'll, I'll focus on this later. You know, before you know it, 10 years later, you're still eating gluten. You still have a family history of gluten, let's say celiac disease, and now you have some um, permanent intestinal degeneration. So there's some things to think about. Okay, then we want the next question here. Uh, hello, Jacqueline. Hello, Maria. Maria from New Zealand. Um, hello Jennifer, hello Linda, I got people from Germany and Sweden and New Zealand, it's fantastic. Okay, Tata, I'm immune compromised, are supplements okay? I take vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, probiotics, and vitamin D. So typically things like vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, probiotics, and vitamin D are very baseline nutrients. They don't seem to cause any significant side effects, even with uh, autoimmune diseases and really chronic inflammatory um, immune dysregulation conditions. So that it's, it's pretty safe to take uh, for the majority of people. There could be some you know, weird gene uniqueness with a certain individual, but for the most part, vitamin C, zinc, magnesium are all, are all great things to just consider on a daily routine. Okay, let's uh, go into here. Mika from Germany, thank you for joining us. Uh, Diana, Dr. K, my 13-year-old boy who is a competitive gym, gymnast for eight years now has been complaining about right shoulder back area. The doctor says nothing structural and inflammation is going on. He also drinks a lot of milk. Can milk be causing inflammation or is just, it was just growing pains or just overusing muscles? Listen, um, if you have some, if you have your boy or anyone with a chronic inflammatory condition and you want to start with diet, milk is definitely on top of the list. And milk has a protein in there called casein. So let me explain some concepts about milk. Um, there's a sugar portion of milk, which is called lactose. And then there's a protein portion of milk, which is casein. And some people are lactose intolerant, so when they can't digest the sugar portion of milk, they get really bloated and distended, and they have to be lactose-free. And that's completely different than the inflammatory reaction from milk, which is generating not against lactose, but against casein. So casein is a protein. Uh, it's very, very inflammatory. And uh, there was a study that was published um, uh, where they looked at different types of milk, uh, cow's milk, uh, goat milk, um, sheep milk, and then almond milk, and soy milk, and coconut milk, and all these different milks. And, you know, cow's milk was, was without question the most inflammatory milk. Uh, the least reactive milk with people was actually human milk, but who drinks human milk? And then uh, um, some of the plant-based milks were was much less inflammatory. So unrelated to an allergy, casein is a protein that tends to really promote inflammation to some degree for most people. So um, if you're going to try to uh, determine if milk is an issue, um, one of the best ways to do it is just to do an elimination provocation diet. So just eliminate the food for two to three weeks, and then you see if the symptoms go away, and then you reintroduce the food and see if there's any adverse reactions. So many, many, many kids have sensitivities to casein, and casein is is also found in goat's milk and sheep milk. So, you know, sometimes people think, well, I'll just use other types of milks, but um, that's not always the case. Even though they may be less inflammatory than cow's milk, that you can still have some significant inflammatory reactions. So um, be aware of that. The, the least inflammatory animal milk was found to be camel milk, um, but cow's milk is definitely the most inflammatory uh, um, version of milk. It has the highest amount of casein in there as well. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Diana. So I would definitely consider going on a milk-free diet for two to three weeks and then as an elimination and then provoke, and then try and milk back in the diet with your boy and see if, if his pain and symptoms come back. Okay, question from Paula. Wait, Paula, thank you for joining. Um, Judy, thank you for joining. Um, okay, Julia, thank you. Uh, and then Rose. Dr. Karasian, please tell me how we can lose, um, oops, sorry, this is it, I just, <laughs> shake it, hold on one second, okay, here we go, I find Rose's question again, 
Sorry guys, I'm still still uh, trying to read through the questions as they come in. Okay. I think one of the questions Rose was asking was how do you how do you lose weight when you have Hashimoto's? Um, and th there is no simple answer to that. You just do it. You, is, is that um, you know what do you? One of the key things to understand about Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism is this is an inflammatory response. And there's a field of immunology called immunometabolism, uh, and they found that inflammation actually shuts down the pathways to burn body fat. So if you have if a person has an autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's then the inflammatory cascade from Hashimoto's will do a few things that really get in the way of people having efficient metabolism to, to lose body weight, if that's their goal. Um, the inflammatory response has been shown to do uh, several things directly to the thyroid. One of the things that the inflammatory response does to the thyroid, um, uh, actually to the ph physiology of thyroid function, is that inflammation disrupts the thyroid receptor sites. So normally when your body, your thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones, or if you're taking thyroid replacement, um, those thyroid hormones bind to receptors and they cause a response, they call it a proteomic response, that changes the metabolic rate and your metabolism speeds up. And then if your metabolism speeds up, you have more calories to burn. So in Hashimoto's, what happens, in other, or in just systemic inflammation, what happens is the inflammatory response dysregulates these thyroid receptors. So when thyroid hormones actually bind to the thyroid receptor to change the metabolic rate, they don't work very efficiently. So one of the things that several papers have published is that chronic inflammation um, dysregulates thyroid receptors, which then changes the metabolic activity. So you know the, the key thing when you're looking at Hashimoto's, one of the things that really gets in the way for people to have a recovery is to get that inflammatory cascade down. Now with Hashimoto's, it's a complex web. There's lots of different things that are causing it. I'm personally teaching a 12-hour advanced course designed for healthcare professionals on Hashimoto's on May 16 and 17 through live streaming um, through the Corazian Institute. Um, and uh, I'm going to go into all the research and all the different mechanisms of Hashimoto's. It's really very um, fascinating how all these complex systems work together. But one of the key things with chronic inflammation in Hashimoto's is it uncouples the receptors. It also slows down the conversion of T4 to T3. It, it happens to some people that have Hashimoto's. And then the inflammatory cascade shuts down an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase, which is used to burn body fat. So when people have Hashimoto's and they're really frustrated, maybe their goal is weight loss with their Hashimoto's, um, it's going to be very hard to do that until you can get the systemic inflammation down. Now, what gets the systemic inflammation down is how well you can modulate your immune system um, and really improving your immune tolerance. I created an online course called the um, Immune Tolerance Program where we go into depth of how to calm down the autoimmune response through diet, nutrition, and lifestyle. Um, you can check that out at Dr. K News, drknews.com, Dr. K News, and, sh and, and look into those strategies. But at the end of the day, the goal has to be to calm down the inflammatory cascade with whatever mechanisms are involved. Okay, next question. Michael Richards, does EFA help with inflammation? Yes, essential fatty acids are critical for damping inflammation. So let me, let me talk about that as well. So when we look at inflammation, uh, inflammation isn't just caused by foods you're sensitive to um, from a dietary perspective. Another cause of inflammation is what type of fats that you have in your diet. And one of the things that we know is you have to have certain fats in your system that are called essential fatty acids um, in order to calm down the inflammatory response. Essential, the word essential comes in because your body can't make these fatty acids. You have to get it from your diet. And essential fatty acids are things like um, fish oils, there are things like uh, foods you get from flaxseed, uh, flaxseed oil, evening, pro, uh, evening primrose oil, um, you know, olive oil. These things all help you make these anti-inflammatory prostaglandins that really calm down your inflammatory cascade. The things that really promote the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins in your body to cause inflammation from a uh, dietary perspective are um, shellfish, red meat, fried foods, and anything that uses partially hydrogenated fats. So anything, any food you eat that's in a bag, like chips or in a box, cookies, processed sweets, anything like that, if they, if they have partially hydrogenated fats, that will initially trigger an inflammatory cascade. So another key mechanism when you're looking at diet, besides food sensitivities that causes chronic inflammation, is your prostaglandin ratio balance. And you know, in the clinical setting, we can take a patient's blood, send it to the lab, and we can measure the prostaglandins and see if they make more of the uh, 
twos and fours, which are more inflammatory, more inflammatories, or more of the one and three prostaglandins, which are more anti-inflammatories, and then kind of make some adjustments to their diet and make a big difference. But if you don't have any complex laboratory testing, the key thing is things like olive oil, um, avocados, healthy flaxseed oil, uh, fish oils, they all help calm down, they all help you give more anti-inflammatory prostaglandins to calm down pro-inflammatory prostaglandins that you may get from processed foods or processed hydrogenated fats and so forth. So in addition to really improving your antioxidant systems by eating really superfoods like pomegranate and blueberries and raspberries and acai and things like that, um, you could also increase your intake of anti-inflammatory uh, fats, which would be like olive oil, flaxseed, fish oil, um, to really calm down the inflammatory mechanism. Okay. Um, Question, Jennifer, how do we learn the information you're teaching medical professionals in May? Sorry, I forgot the name of the conference. Oh, Jennifer, um, the name of the conference is, uh, well, the name of the educational website is the Karazian Institute. Really, it's my last name. It's very long, K-H-A-R-R-A-Z-I-A-N institute.com. And then I have lots of different uh, courses there. Um, some that we've done in the past, they're all on, on demand. And then we have, when we first teach a course, we do it live stream and then it's on demand. But we do have one coming up on Hashimoto's. That's great. Okay, question. Cheryl O'Brien, what is recommended for constipation? So constipation can be caused by different things. Constipation can be caused by, um, for example, the gut and the nervous system degenerating. We talked about that'll cause chronic constipation that people just don't recover from. And one of the key findings with that is it's nothing's helped. And when they take fiber, they get worse. Those are all signs of a neurodegenerated gut. Constipation can happen from lack of, let's say, thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones impact the motility of the gut. Constipation can happen because you're not getting enough water, which is actually the most common cause of constipation is lack of water and a sedentary lifestyle. So you need to have water to change your, your bowel concentration. You need to have movement. And when you exercise and move, what actually happens is you get increased uh, um, activation of your vagus and then as that vagus system is activated in your brainstem, which then co coordinates your gut function, you start to have an improved motility. So I would definitely, it's, you know, the, the, sometimes the easiest thing with constipation is just the more water and exercise. And sometimes it's not just more water, it's just that they're just persons drinking too much coffee and too much tea and having a diuretic effect and not counteracting with enough hydration. Those are major causes of constipation. Pathogens in the gut can create change the, the environment and cascade to cause uh, um, different types of constipation. When you're looking at things like different bacteria in the gut, if you have dysbiosis and negative bacteria, um, then you can release things like methane. And methane gas will slow down the motility of the gut. So sometimes it's like the bacteria in your gut that are causing chronic constipation, they're dysregulated. Sometimes you don't have hormones to your gut to make the smooth muscles contract like hypothyroidism. Sometimes the nervous system in the gut is an issue. That, that's causing the smooth muscles to not contract. So it's a combination of those various things. Sometimes you just not um, eat, have enough digestive enzymes to help you. You have to have, for example, when you eat food, your stomach has to release hydrochloric acid and your bowel has to get acidic enough to then trigger your gallbladder to contract and, and then really turn that cascade of events that are taking place from, from chewing all the way down to producing bowel movements. So um, it's not one thing. So chronic constipation can be caused um, from, from all those uh, various mechanisms. Okay, next question here from Donna. If your diet is clean and you're still inflamed, what should you look at? If your diet is clean and you're still inflamed, then you should definitely look at environmental triggers. Environmental triggers could be uh, pollutants in the air, could be just your antioxidant reserves. Um, sometimes, again, um, like I was trying to ex explain with, with uh, um, the, the, the first part of this um, video, was that you know when you look at inflammation, if there's triggers versus your antioxidant reserve systems. You just may need to really boost up your antioxidant reserve systems. Now you can you can you can do that with diet, but you can also just start taking antioxidants. Um, especially you can take things like um, pomegranate extract, acai extract, superfood extracts. Those can really help you increase your antioxidant reserves pretty quickly. You can really increase your good fats and take things like fish oil and olive oil, that can really increase your uh, anti-inflammatory cascade. So sometimes it's not that your diet is too inflamed, it's just that your body has uh, the, not enough reserves or your prostaglandins are shifted in an abnormal way. Um, 
you should also be aware of that, you know, um, some people have sensitivities to very extreme sensitives to mold and, and they have very high mold antibodies when you check their blood, their blood and they have this immune reactivity to mold. Sometimes a damp building will cause those symptoms for them. So it doesn't always have to be food. It can, it can definitely be environment. Um, there are some people that have chronic pathogens. Like you, you'll check a person and you do a routine blood test and you see their white blood cells are really low and their lymphocytes are high. And they tell you, oh, that's always been that way. No one knows why. Then you find out that they have a chronic virus and you treat their immune system and then their inflammation goes away. So inflammation can be caused by foods, by uh, chemicals, by air, by pollutants, and it can be caused by infections. So at the end of the day, you just want to go down that cascade. And at the same time, you want to try to look at antioxidant uh, in your diet and foods that have anti-inflammatory effects. And the combination of those are, are really the, kind of the big picture. Okay. Can you comment on bloating from food and slow transit times? Well, again, slow transit times is related to the constipation issue. I think those are all uh, the same concepts. And then if you have a hard time moving your food, then there's a, there's a fermentation. Your foods are normally, your bacteria is, in, is definitely fermenting your food, and that can really cause bloating. So if, you're, if your transit time is slow, you may experience that fermentation that's that's happening slowly because of lack of movement as bloating. Okay. Okay, uh, let's take a look at a question here. Uh, Dr. K, please let us know where to look on your site. Testing required to figure out why bile is low. Gallbladder is not flowing. Sometimes it's not digesting fats as well. Been on issue after out from non-celiac sensitivity. Thanks more for your attention to this over 40 issues. Okay, so gallbladder and bile is another key issue. Um, let me talk about that really quickly too, because it does impact your intestinal motility and gut function and so forth as well. So, when when people get older, especially it it happens in uh, women, but men or women when they get older, usually around age forty, and especially if they have insulin issues and they're pre-diabetic and overweight, um, they tend to have a tendency to start to develop gallstones or what's called gallbladder sludge. And when this happens, the first thing they'll notice is they just don't tolerate fats. So when they eat fatty foods, they get really bloated, they get really distended. Fatty foods could be fried foods, or fatty foods could be fish oil, <laughs> or some, whatever the, 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 the source is. Fried foods definitely have a greater effect. But when people eat, or, or like a really fatty meal, like a piece of salami, if they get really bloated and distended from that, that's a, bit, that's a really uh, big clue that the person may be suffering from gallbladder issues. Now, the healthcare system doesn't really address galls, they call gallbladder sludge, which you can see with an ultrasound or a gallstone until there's obstruction. But prior to the obstruction, when the gallbladder is not functioning well, people have symptoms. So in those cases, you really need to basically go off fats, um, and then you definitely can supplement with um, things like uh, uh, lipase to help you digest your fats and people actually use bile salts to dissolve gallbladder sludge and those are you know you can find those on health food stores on Amazon to help so uh, those are some things to really help with gallbladder issues and then you want to basically take uh, bile salts and lipase and avoid fats for a few weeks and then see if your gallbladder can function better uh, after that okay let's go on to next question I have parentitis over 10 years. Dentists don't know why after taking care of both parents who passed with Alzheimer's disease. I'm experiencing a number of cognitive concerns. I sat for five years doctor's office to only hear about four drugs that cause many side effects from my mom and dad. Well, Cheryl, I'm sorry to hear that. If you have, you know, an inflammatory gum disease for over 10 years, you know, it's, it's um, sometimes you don't really treat the gums, you treat the whole body. And this comes back to the concept of inflammation and antioxidant reserves. So there's a point where you just don't, when you have a chronic um, inflammatory response in one area, for someone it could be a bad back, a bad hip, it could be inflamed gums, an inflamed gut. Sometimes when you're really trying to get a clinical effect, you just forget the, to you try to forget localizing anti-inflammatory treatments for the tissue with like a topical gel or some kind of medicine, and you just try to improve the body's anti-inflammatory reserves for whatever that may be. So that may be a combination of dietary things we talked about, high antioxidant, uh, and high antioxidant uh, nutritional protocol. It could be trying to um, calm down the um, 
triggers that you can identify, whether it's food proteins or environmental pollutants or chemicals. But a lot of times in my practice, when I'm dealing with patients that complain of some kind of chronic inflammatory disease, in your case, inflammatory gum disease, sometimes you just forget the condition and just focus on the whole patient and try to improve health. Now, if you're having chronic inflammatory gum disease and you're also having some issues with uh, cognitive decline, that is a concern. We know that some of the bacteria that are involved with gum disease are linked to developing Alzheimer's. There's a paper that um, uh, we published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. It was myself, uh, Dr. Risto, and Omar Vajitani, and uh, we looked at uh, 30 pathogens and showed that antibodies from pathogens can promote alpha amyloid plaque in the brain. And that paper is available if you're interested in it on, if you just go to the PubMed or National Library of Medicine, um, that in my name, you'll see a paper come up with beta amyloid plaques and pathogens. And uh, the key thing is that when you have this inflammatory cascade that, that's taking place in your gums, um, some of those same bacterial antibodies are then maybe promoting inflammatory reactions in the brain as well. But in general, inflammation anywhere in the body is going to have an impact on our wells as well. Okay, um, next question from Stephanie. Is camel milk okay? Well, camel milk has less casein, is less reactive than cow's milk, but it just depends on your reaction to casein. For some people, it's fine, and for some people, camel milk is still an inflammatory trigger, but um, it is lower in casein and is less reactive with with, uh, with people than, than, than the other types of uh, milks. Okay, question from David. Yeah, good, good to have you on board, David. Uh, hi, Detease. How helpful do you find checking lab panel for allergy to lectins in decreasing inflammation? David, I find that increasingly valuable. So when you're looking at uh, reactions to lectins, there's been a lot of popularity in lectins recently, especially with chronic autoimmune disease and inflammation because of some popular books and some things that have come out. But we've always known that patients that had things like have conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, that they really couldn't handle nightshade foods, and nightshade foods, for example, eggplant and, and tomato being the most commonly eaten nightshades. There's the, the proteins in the seeds are lectins, and lectins are significantly uh, triggers for the immune response. Now, there's lectins found in gluten, in wheat, actually not in gluten, but in wheat. Um, when you look at wheat, there's a different section of the wheat structure besides gluten, which is the protein. There's the sugary, sticky portion of wheat called wheat germaglutinin. And there's different agglutinins and things like um, peas and different nuts and seeds. And sometimes those reactions are very inflammatory. So um, we're actually completing a paper right now where we looked at several hundred uh, blood uh, samples of people that have autoimmune disease and reacted to lectins. And we find a much, much more higher risk and odds of developing autoimmunity if you have reactions to lectins. So we know there's some correlations there. But the, here's the thing with lectins. So when you look at food sensitivity testing, the way food sensitivity testing works in the lab is you have a, what's called an ELISA plate, a dish, and it has these wells on it, and there's 24 wells. And then you stick a protein in each well, and um, you incubate it, you clean it, and you have this, this well with these proteins that are in these wells. Take the patient's blood, you put it into the wells, and you see if there's a reaction um, in, in uh, you know, antigen antibody reaction and they use different dyes and the colors change and then you can measure that through an optical density machine and, and get an idea of how significant that reaction is. So when you look at food sensitivities, um, sometimes you won't see that the lectin is actually causing it unless you test for wheat germaglutinin compared to just wheat. A patient may test to wheat but not to wheat germaglutinin um, or they may test to pea agglutinin versus just pea protein. And when you understand why, it's because when you look at the lab, if you have a well and all you do is put pea protein in it and then you measure the blood antibodies reacting to it, it may not be significant enough to really show an antigen antibody reaction because of lots of other things in the pea, uh, pea structure. But when you just purify the lectin portions of wheat and put it into a well, they can see a significant reaction. So the laboratory testing becomes much, much more sensitive uh, when you actually have lab that measure not only like let's say wheat but wheat germaglutinin not only pea but pea agglutinin not only soy but soy agglutinin and the only lab that I know that does that is the Cyrex laboratory and uh, you will find many people that have reactions to lectins when they actually measure the agglutinin and lectin portion of, of foods now for those of you that don't have laboratory testing available 
just be aware that, especially if you have rheumatoid disease, like rheumatoid arthritis, um, that there's a high degree of sensitivity to lectins. Or if any of you guys have ever had a laboratory test done called rheumatoid factor, rheumatoid factor is just agglutination of two antibodies, IgG and IgM together. That's an agglutinin response. And people that have this agglutinin or sticky or proteins together response are typically very sensitive to foods high in lectins, which are basically um, foods that have uh, seeds in them like tomatoes and eggplant or actual nuts and seeds and so forth. So I hope that answers your question, but definitely there are some people that have sensitivities to lectins as the main trigger for the inflammation. Okay, Charlene, what are the best supplements to boost the immune system along with diet? Well, you know, the best supplements to boost your immune system is going to, I mean, if you ask 10 different people, you're going to hear 10 different things. So you can have a personal opinion about which supplements are the best supporting the immune system, or you can just, just base it on the literature. So, uh, and there's so many different parts of the stimulating the immune system because it really depends on what you want to stimulate. But I think that what mo many people are concerned about right now is what do you do for enhancing upper respiratory infection protection um, from a nutritional perspective? And if you do a literature search, the most profound amount of information you're going to find, or the highest degree of evidence, um, in the literature is echinacea. <laughs> and it may not be because it's the strongest botanical that helps with upper respiratory immune support, but it's the one that has the most papers published. Um, and there's several clinical trials done in echinacea in humans and even meta-analyses where they combine multiple trials together and then look at the composite score of all their data outcome and then determine the effect of the supplement. So echinacea is very inexpensive. It's a very... Um, commonly available botanical that really increases natural killer cells and T cells and can really boost your your immune system. Um, now, there's no, we don't know if that has any impact positively or negatively on coronavirus or, or any, you know, anything that specific, which no one knows, but it is, as far as evidence goes, one of the, the cheap, one of the most uh, published botanical for supporting the immune system right now. And uh, that's something to consider if you're just looking at taking some stuff. There's lots of other things you can do. You can obviously take zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin A, and then you can take antioxidants or food concentrate, uh, um, like uh, acai concentrate or pomegranate concentrate, um, blueberry extract. Those things all support the anti-inflammatory system. Okay, let's go into uh, next question here. From Lorna, greetings from Jamaica. May I ask about scleroderma, the autoimmune condition with the highest mortality? What I'm finding that specialists in functional medicine do not talk a lot about scleroderma. I'm doing diet, sleep, stress reduction, hydration, exercise, no internal symptoms, but my external symptoms advance slowly with incrementally. Is this one of the very difficult ones to manage with that conventional meds and skin problems seem to be difficult to treat like hair loss, tight face and lips? So scleroderma is one of the systemic autoimmune diseases, and anytime you start going into systemic autoimmune diseases, um, they're, they're, they are def they're def they're definitely more difficult to clinically manage with that nutrition lifestyle. So um, when you're looking at things like DNA antibodies or ANA antibodies, um, and you have those types of conditions where scleroderma fits in that category, the immune antibody response is against actual DNA and actual cartilage and joint proteins throughout the body so it's, so when there's a trigger there's a chronic inflammatory trigger it's, it's very specific it's very systemic compared to someone who has Hashimoto's where the autoimmune response is maybe just the thyroid gland or has rheumatoid arthritis where it's just in their joint cartilage but when you're starting to scleroderma you're starting to get what are called DNA or ANA antibodies and those autoimmune diseases are much much more difficult to, to manage so you still got to do what you got to do. You still have to look for all the different dietary lifestyle triggers to make a difference. But to answer your question, yes. Um, systemic autoimmune diseases or autoimmune diseases that have anti-nuclear or DNA antibodies are much, much more difficult to clinically manage. Okay, next question. I've done your program with FMD. Who used, who used your program with me after being on it for nine months? I'm not sure what FMD is. Dixie, I don't really understand your question. So I'm gonna skip, um, I'm sorry. Okay, Marina, do all food sensitivities translate into symptoms, which provides clues through the process of elimination, or is it testing a better option in these cases? 
Karina, let me answer your question about food sensitivities. So not all food sensitivities translate into noticeable symptoms. So the first thing to understand about a response to a food protein is there's different antibody reactions to the food protein. Now, what's called allergy is the most severe and in, in the quickest response to a food protein. And that's measured by an IgE, immunoglobulin E response. And for those um, that are doing testing, they would do like an IgE panel to foods, and then those are considered allergies. And they have an immediate mast cell histamine response, and they trigger an inflammatory cascade, and that's the typical food allergy. Now, when you look at food sensitivity, uh, food sensitivity are, are generated by different antibodies, IgG, immunoglobulin G, IgM, IgA, and uh, those reactions are slow and delayed. Now, lots of people have food sensitivities, but they don't necessarily have symptoms. And some people do, so I'll give you an example. If we did a food sensitivity profile on, um, let's say, a group of patients, um, they will many times notice, like, you know, some people have no sensitivities, and some people have a few, and some people have, they're sensitive to almost everything you test, but they don't always have reactions when they when they eat those foods. Now, these non-allergy food sensitivities with IgG, IgM, IgA, they take several um, days or hours to show a reaction. And sometimes there's a cumulative effect where you eat one and then two and three and then you notice the response versus if you just had one of the foods by itself, your antioxidant, anti-inflammatory system can, can quench it. So back to the same concept we're talking about. Um, if you get a trigger that causes inflammation, like let's say food sensitivity, how strong your antioxidant reserves are at that time can determine if you have symptoms or not. Some food reactions um, on a lab test, let's say you have Ig, uh, M to shrimp, um, and then you have IgM to, uh, let's say, peanut. <laughs> you may have a greater response with one food or the other, even though the, the labs both have IgM. One could be noticeable to the patient, one may not. So there's different variations of, of things besides the antibody test. Now, um, some people like to do food sensitivity testing because it helps them identify foods they can't pick up for their symptoms. So it's not uncommon um, for a person to be chronically inflamed. They do a food sensitivity test. They find, let's say, six foods that they react to. They stop eating those foods and they notice their inflammation goes down. So that's one example. Another example is you have a person who, let's say, tests uh, food, food sensitivities with the 100 foods with a panel. And of the 100 foods, they show up to 50. That's called a loss of immune tolerance. And in those cases, when they're reacting to almost every food that's being tested, or let's say more than a third of the foods that are being tested, um, simply just removing those foods are not gonna work because that's the more progressed immune dysfunction. And what happens with people that have um, this pattern where they show up to at least most of the foods they test show positive, and that's, being, that's the basically called loss of immune tolerance, is if they avoid those foods and eat new foods, then the new foods they test will all start to show up on a follow-up test. So if we have a patient that shows up with on a panel of 100 foods with, let's say, 35 foods, we eliminate all 35 foods and repeat the test. They're not gonna show antibodies to the foods they've eliminated because they're not eating them, but now they're showing antibodies to all the new foods they added in. So that's a different scenario. And to answer that question, that's why I put together my program, Immune Tolerance Program, where we talk about how to, to modulate that. And in those cases where we see people have loss of immune tolerance, if we have, let's say, 35 foods that show up positive, what we'll have them do is look at the third, 35 foods that they're testing antibodies for, um, they're having high levels of antibodies for, and we go, which one of these do you notice cause symptoms? And they go, well, I definitely know, for example, cashew causes symptoms or whatever. Then they remove that food, but the other 34, they may not have so many symptoms, and then we work on their immune tolerance and will repeat the test, and if they go from 35 foods now to six that they're reacting to without changing their diet, then we know we've supported their immune tolerance. So when we're trying to treat immune tolerance, we don't always eliminate all the foods, we just improve their immune tolerance, and then use that baseline food sensitivity test uh, as a way to determine if their their reactions to food proteins getting better, but not having changing those foods. So that's you know sometimes the different things to think about when you're looking at uh, food sensitivities and inflammation. Okay, let me um, go into the next question here. From Dana, I know I have multiple food intolerances, including histamines, oxalates, and some food and FODMAPs. I am trying to diversify my diet and improve my oral tolerance with the microbiome mashup. 
This is something we talk about in our oral tolerance program. Uh, should the food groups be included in the mashup in small amounts the rest of my diet or should they be avoided? I know they cause issues and inflammation. So Dana, if you know you have, if you know that you, or if you're doing the veggie mashup and you know you have reactions to some of the foods, vegetables, you should not include them in the veggie mashup. You should try to diversify with other foods as much as, as possible. Now, if you're reacting to every single vegetable, then you might have to actually include it. But if it's just a few, it'd be best not to. But if you, some people react to every vegetable and they can't do a mashup. And if that's the case, you still need the diversity of the plant fibers to diversify the gut. And in the long run, it should help you develop your tolerance. So um, it's not, not that, you know, I hope you understand the concept there. It's, uh, but that's, that's how it works. Okay. Question from Nen. Can you comment on how a stressful relationship with partner affects brain health? Yeah, you definitely don't. You definitely want to be with a healthy partner uh, to improve your brain health. And uh, you know, when they look at studies on happiness and they look at studies on well-being and, phys and, and the physiology of uh, healthy aging, one of the key factors they find is their social relationships have a bigger factor than anything else. And um, the, the feeling of having support and um, feeling that you have someone to share things with make all the difference in, in long-term health. So whether it's brain health or any kind of health, um, if you're in involved with a relationship that is unhealthy and uh, you just constantly feel terrible being in that relationship, it's definitely going to have a serious impact on your physiology. So something to really think about. And I, and I can tell you working with chronic patients and patients suffering from chronic diseases, um, it really is the most overlooked area. And you can see people focusing all their time on their food and diet and all that, but they really don't pay attention to their relationships and their environment and that really sometimes is the game changer to change the health around so something to just you know think about okay next question what is the ideal ratio for epa dha official for someone with high lipoprotein a so lipoprotein a is a marker for um cardiovascular disease like it's a like bad cholesterol uh in a sense and there is no ideal ratio people make them up um, EPA DHA ratios people have people r r randomly make them up um, so uh, I would say if you take a look at most officials there's EPA and DHA content and they both have an anti-inflammatory content so let me explain what, what the question is when you look at fish oils fish oils have two types of anti-inflammatory compounds one is called EPA and one's called DHA and then there's theories about if you have a higher ratio of one or the other that you can have better anti-inflammatory effect. And that's not necessarily true. There's been some studies that show, for example, the DHA portion of fish oils have a greater effect on brain synaptic activity and mem cell membranes of the brain, and, and not as much as the EPA. And the EPA has a better systemic anti-inflammatory response than DHA. But both EPA and DHA components of fish oils have an effect. And then when you look at ratios, um, there is really no established ratio of how much EPA versus DHA shown someone should have. For me, in a clinical setting, when I'm trying to improve, when I'm trying to really um, support brain synaptic activity versus inflammation, um, I'll use I'll use a high DHA content because DHA seems to have some greater impact on cell membranes. But as far as inflammation goes, both EPA and DHA have a great effect. And 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 uh, just using a typical fish oil with EPA DHA should be should be totally fine for getting a significant inflammatory effect. Some of the stuff you hear about higher EPA or DHA ratios or perfect ratio are, are literally made up. And, uh, you know, uh, I can't comment more on that. Okay, next question. Okay. Can you make suggestions about chronically low iron, particularly how much to limit red meat? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure about your question about chronically low iron. Um, I gotta be honest with you, Heidi, the question you're asking, most people that, it, that, that get diagnosed with chronically low iron, um, typically misdiagnosed. So I'm not sure if they're looking at your serum ferritin at a different range, but if you truly are iron anemic, which is on your lab test, your hemoglobin hematic at RBC, MCV, MCH, MCH, you're all low, your total iron body capacity is high, and your serum iron is low, then you definitely have an iron deficiency. And the most common cause of iron deficiency are actually not from dietary intake of iron. They're from internal bleeding. They're from uh, 
uh, really have you know really heavy menstrual cycles or things like that so those are the things to, to really uh, look into first if you're not absorbing iron that could be another issue so people that don't have enough hydrochloric acid have a hard time uh, absorbing iron and if you notice that you, you don't you have an aversion to meat and you don't want to eat meat because uh, it feels like it's a brick in your stomach you're not digesting well you may want to add some hydrochloric acid into your protocol so sometimes um, if someone is having a hard time absorbing iron, we'll make sure they take some hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes with their meals. Also add in vitamin C, and vitamin C helps enhance his iron absorption, and then we'll use iron. There's different iron supplements out there. Uh, for me personally, I, I, I tend to like to use a liver extract form of iron where the, um, because it doesn't make people as sick and nauseous. So when they use liver extract forms of iron, like the product is actually liver extract, with HCL and vitamin C, they can really take a lot of iron without feeling constipated, nauseous, and they can have great absorption that way. So maybe that, that can answer your question. Okay. Um, let me go into the next question here. Susan, please explain the nitric oxide connection to optimal resiliency and when how it's best way to promote endogenous production of nitric oxide. If the antioxidant reserves are depleted, can it be harmful? So nitric oxide is a compound your body makes, and there's actually three different isomers of nitric oxide, or three different uh, variations of nitric oxide. One is called um, INOS, or cytokine-inducible nitric oxide, and when that goes up, it creates inflammation and destruction. And that's important for fighting infections. So sometimes your body has an infection and they have to actually increase the free radical inflammatory oxidative stress response like INOS to destroy infection. And then there's another part of nitric oxide um, isomers, or there's another isomer called EONOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and that calms down, uh, improves blood flow and circulation, and dilates blood vessels. So you really want to have um, a balance of, uh, of both. One of the most powerful compounds to support nitric oxide pathways is uh, beet extract. It helps to uh, dampen the inflammatory one and the yeah, activate the EONOS one or just consuming beets. If you like to eat beets, those are a great way to really improve your nitric oxide isomer systems. And um, I'm not a big fan of arginine. Arginine is a precursor amino acid to help make nitric oxide. But if your inflammatory cascade is up, um, when you give arginine, it may not be the best idea. I would rather use beet extract or things like venpocetine to modulate the different I, I versus EONOS isomers of nitric oxide. Okay, let me go into a less technical question. Okay. From Kathy, you mentioned pathogens in the gut. Where would these come from? Does this include parasites, which I hear a lot about? Yeah, a lot of people have parasites. Now, there's some really shocking information about pathogens and parasites in the immune literature. And what they're finding is that in areas with the highest amounts of parasitic infections, like different regions of um, Africa, in certain areas of South America that there is no autoimmune disease. That some of these gut pathogens may actually provide an anti-inflammatory immune regulating effect in the gut. And in a clinical setting, I've absolutely seen that as well. So uh, sometimes you run a GI panel on a patient that suspects may have gastrointestinal pathogens and they show up with a couple parasites or bugs. And then you go on this journey to get rid of them whether they do pharmaceutical interventions or they do uh, botanical interventions, but a lot of times when you see those pathogens gone, you can sometimes see an autoimmune disease significantly flare up. Other times you can see that it really makes the patient feel better. So, you know, I think we're still learning a lot about pathogens in the gut. Obviously, some people have significant symptoms and diarrhea and intestinal permeability and there's markers on GI panels where you can look at intestinal inflammation, like secretory IgA, for example, which is an immune response to a pathogen in the gut. Um, there's different inflammatory proteins like calprotectin that can be measured when they do a stool analysis. If those are all up and there's a pathogen there, it may be, may be a good idea to probably get rid of it. They come from everywhere. They come from your diet. They come from exposure to um, different food sources. Um, you, sometimes just contaminated sources to your foods you may not even know about and um, you know it'd be surprising if you were to check a large group of people you see many people have gut pathogens now if someone doesn't have the inflammatory markers in their gut they don't have a lot of symptoms 
um, you really have to question whether you want to necessarily go and treat the pathogen because there's a there's a physiological cost to treating a pathogen. You have to, you know, you actually break down the gut barrier in most cases with, with different protocols to, to get rid of a pathogen and you have inflammation to deal with and so forth. So um, that's an interesting concept you brought up about pathogens. So now, for some people, they do have a gastrointestinal pathogen and, and it does cause chronic inflammation for them. And from other people, it actually has the opposite effect. So it's an area that I, be, to be honest with you, I'm confused about too. So uh, my strategy right now is if I see someone that has a gut pathogen and symptoms and inflammatory markers on their GI panel, then it's probably better to treat. But if a patient just has a pathogen that you measure and there's no inflammatory reaction uh, with gastrointestinal inflammatory markers, then maybe you should have a second thought if you should treat it or not. And it really, for me, I just let, let the patient's gut instinct tell, tell us where to go. Okay. Um, Next question from Sham, Shamshad. Does papaya fruit powder contain sugars? I'm fructose intolerant. Thank you. So it, 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 it would depend upon your extract content. So you can get different fruit, fruit extracts, and they can have different degrees of uh, fructose in there uh, based on how they extracted it. So you'd have to actually read the label and, and determine if that's appropriate for you. If you have fructose intolerances, um, you, pro you, you really want to make sure there's no fructose in that powder. They're just isolating the flavonoid extract from papaya or any other fruit, then it should be fine. Okay. Anika Meehan. What well, well, that went away. Let me see. Whoops. Joe Clark. I had mild hypoglycemia diagnosed when very young and eat a low sugar diet but still have blood sugar issues and worried about the effect on the brain. Should I take metformin despite not being diabetic? So if you're hypoglycemic, it means your blood sugar drops. So that basically means throughout the day you get shaky, lightheaded, irritable, you eat, you feel like you can function again. That's a sign of low blood sugar. Metformin is actually going to improve your insulin uh, signaling, so you'll actually, have a, you'll actually become more hypoglycemic if you take it. Metformin is not really designed for hypoglycemic. It's, it's really designed for people that have uh, prediabetes or insulin resistance. So it would not make sense to do that. Now, if you have hypoglycemia for a long period of time, and have a low sugar diet, but still have blood sugar issues, then you get to figure out why that's taking place. Um, sometimes it's just really because you have, um, you know, functionally weak adrenal glands that they're not responding. So other times you may have actually some adrenal antibodies. There's a there's a percentage of the population that I've seen in my clinical practice that have chronic low blood sugar issues, low blood pressure issues, crave salt all the time, crave sugar. And um, when we check, they actually have antibodies to their adrenal glands. They have the subtle autoimmunity against their adrenal glands. Now, the adrenal glands help uh, produce cortisol and uh, catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, to help keep your blood sugar, like hypoglycemia, in check. So what I found is that what I'm seeing is that there's a percentage of people that have these adrenal antibodies. Now, the autoimmune disease for adrenal antibodies is called Addison's disease. And, and to be diagnosed with Addison's disease by conventional laboratories right now, where they do this 24-hour measurement of adrenal hormones in the urine, or they do something called an ACTH stimulation test, which is they inject you with a hormone and see your adrenal response to it. Those tests only show positive when a person has lost about 90% of their adrenal glands. So there are a lot of people that have chronic hypoglycemia walking around out there that have not lost 90% of the adrenal glands, maybe they've lost 20% or 30% from a subtle autoimmune reaction that's there, but they never test positive for Addison, so they walk in the healthcare system constantly ignored, and they're kind of clueless and they're really struggling to figure out how to get their low blood sugar symptoms under control. So the way you do identify that is you just measure adrenal antibodies, 21-hydroxylase um, antibodies against adrenal glands, will be the key marker to look at. And if those 21 hydroxyl antibodies are positive, then maybe the best way to handle the blood sugar issue is to really work on the autoimmune system and look for an autoimmune clinical model and see if you can uh, get the immune attack against the adrenal glands off so the subclinical autoimmune response isn't there anymore. And, and for some people, that's the only way to get rid of their chronic low blood sugar issues and it's a, it's it's not easy it's a tough battle and it's there's uh, ongoing efforts to try to optimize the patient when they're struggling with that kind of pattern but there are many 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 of those patients around I've seen them in my practice or, uh, 
over the years uh, all the time. Okay, uh, next question here. Uh, I have a 38-year-old female patient with Hashimoto's disease. She is a vegan. She could not get pregnant and had two miscarriages. What tests or mechanisms could I check on her to be able to help her? I don't know. You know, the key thing with... Um, I mean, you have to have substantial, you have to have enough protein in order to maintain your immune health and your endocrine system. Um, I think the biggest mistake we see with vegans is that even despite the fact they're thinking they're getting enough protein, they're not getting enough protein. So, um, and also healthy fats. So, you know, a lot of times we'll see vegans do two things that really impact their physiology and their health. One is they just don't get enough protein. They're not getting complete proteins, and to get complete proteins, they'll have to combine food sources together. So, for example, bean has some protein, rice has some protein, but when they're combined together, you get a complete protein, and that's you know that's a key thing. So you have to do proper um, food combining to get complete protein sources, and you're getting enough protein sources being a vegan to really have a healthy endocrine and immune system. And the other key thing is you got to have healthy fats. So sometimes we see vegans just not getting enough healthy fats in their diet. And uh, if it was me and I was working with a patient that um, was a vegan, then getting healthy amounts of fats and protein is, is really important. What I've seen in my clinical career over the years is what I call the junk food vegetarian or the junk food vegan. They, they basically um, eat potato chips, <laughs> bad food, unhealthy foods all day, and uh, they, they just don't have any a rich uh, nutrient diet so that's one thing to to, to be aware of um, but anyways those are some key things and also the other key thing is you have to have uh, some degree of caloric intake to to support your system too so sometimes people that are vegans they just may not be eating enough calories to support their endocrine system okay um, but you know there are people that practice uh, vegan diet very effectively and they have lots of health benefits from that so uh, it's just a matter of if, if protein and fats and caloric intake are enough to, to meet their endocrine immune demands. Okay. What can someone do about effects of dysautonomia resulting from a car accident? Gut motility and empty speeds, diaphragm function was also impacted. Okay, so let me, let me explain this concept, dysautonomia, really quickly to people that may not know that term. So the nervous system has... Um, to, well, the autonomic nervous system, the part of your brain that triggers physiological responses without you uh, volitionally thinking about them, like your heart rate, your blood pressure, your intestinal motility, um, has a sympathetic system, which is the fight or flight, which increases your heart rate and it gets blood flow to your muscles and dilates your pupils, and then a parasympathetic system where you have motility and digestion and so forth. And this should be in balance. One of the things that happens after traumatic brain injuries is uh, the brain gets injured and areas of the brain that control this autonomic system um, are no longer working efficiently. And then the person can have palpitations and inward trembling and, and constipation issues and hyperactive bowels and all these things, and that's called dysautonomia. There's a paper that I published also, um, and it was called The Brain Gut Access. And I went over, I think it was traumatic brain injury and the brain got access. And in this paper that was published, I, I went in through all the details of what, of all the literature review of what happens to uh, the gut from a brain injury. And dysautonomia is very common. And there's some papers that listed, you know, about a third of patients that get a traumatic brain injury end up with some degree of dysautonomia. Now, the treatment of choice for that is just to improve brain function. Ultimately, um, the way you control the autonomic system is to not, not necessarily treat the palpitations or treat the gut motility or constipation issues, but really to really focus on treating the brain. Um, uh, if you don't know what that means, you may want to check out a book I wrote, um, uh, Why Is My Brain Not Working? I go into a very detailed way of how to support the brain. I also created an online program for patients to help figure out how to support their own brain called Save Your Brain Program. It's at Dr. K News. And you can check that program out. And I go into a step-by-step, -step week, week by week of different strategies you can use to improve your brain function, um, like controlling your blood sugar and looking at your fatty acids and so forth, and then implementing those each week to, to improve that. Uh, if you don't have access to really someone to help support the patient with a traumatic brain injury with that, you may want to check, check that course out as well. But ultimately, with this autonomy for traumatic brain injury, you just have to improve the, 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 the brain itself. Great. Okay, next question is coming in from Mary Moyer. 
What is your recommendation for mercury poisoning from amalgams? <sighs> well, uh... <laughs> I don't okay so let's just talk about mercury amalgams for a second so they're not good um, they are they, they will increase the toxic load um, and there's different people that will have different reactions to mercury uh, based on again their antioxidant reserves and the resilience to having a um, environmental uh, toxic chemical in their system some people uh, um, have it in their system their whole life. They never develop chronic disease and autoimmune diseases because the resilience is so healthy and some people can timeline their medical history. I had fillings put in and then I noticed from that point my health declined or and so forth or I had fillings put in and then I started to have cracks in them and then my health started to decline. So there's different degrees of reactions with them. But we definitely know in the immune literature and the toxicology literature that mercury does have uh, significant adverse effects on the nervous system, on the brain, and uh, is something you don't want to. It's a, it's a toxic compound. You don't want it in your system. The problem is that um, some of the people that I've seen that I've worked with have had the, the, the turning the corner of getting significantly worse or falling apart right when they had their mercury fillings removed. So removal of mercury fillings um, has to be done by a qualified uh, dentist that is using a dam where the mercury fillings are not chopping backwards. They're using a vacuum to get rid of the vapors. And they're usually doing them not all at once. They're doing it over a period of time. So that's one thing to take to, take, to put into consideration. Now for myself, when I, when I work with really um, chronically sick autoimmune disease patients that really have no room for a flare-up. Um, maybe you know, some of my patients are in a wheelchair, they have MS, they, if they have a flare-up, they, they may have such severe impacts in their function that it would be devastating. And so when you're in that scenario all the time, you're working with people that have no chance to have a flare-up, uh, the question sometimes comes up is, should I have my mercury fillings removed? So one of the things I like to do is, I like to check three things right away. I like to check if they have antibodies to mercury bound to albumin. Um, and they do this through a panel from Cyrex called Cyrex Array 12. And they check chemicals, but they don't check the levels of chemicals. They check the chemicals and if there's antibody or immune reactions to chemicals. So when chemicals are in your circulating your blood, they, they actually start to attach to proteins in your blood. The main protein in your blood is albumin, and then that albumin changes that becomes a new protein, and then you can make antibodies against it. And that's an immune reaction to, to, to mercury, not a, not a load or level. So if they have immune reactions to mercury, uh, there's a very strong possibility that if they try to get their amalgams removed, they're going to fall apart and have a significant flare-up of their autoimmune disease. Also, I check to see if they have blood-brain barrier permeability and intestinal permeability. Because despite all efforts, to uh, use a vacuum, oops, that's my dog, or to use a vacuum or, or a dam to get rid of uh, um, mercury vapors when it's being removed, there's still some exposure. So if the blood brain barrier and if the blood brain barrier is permeable, then you can have some significant uh, uh, deposition of mercury into system, into the brain, especially when you increase load from removal. So the best things to really do is if, if, you, if you are having concerns about mercury, make sure you're healthy enough and safe enough to remove them. Uh, raising your glutathione levels, maybe doing IV glutathione beforehand and making sure your blood brain barrier is, is intact and your gut barrier is intact and really having a strong antioxidant reserves before you go into um, mercury removal and then working with a qualified uh, dentist that is that is specialized in removing mercury and take all the precautions to do it would be the way to go. Okay, so that's a long question, uh, long answer, but it's important. Next question, do you know why pea protein affects blood sugar with diabetics? So it may not be the, it may not be the glycemic effect that you're noticing with diabetics, but it may be the immune response to pea protein that's an issue. So um, pea protein itself is low glycemic and uh, there's a paper that I published um, in the Journal of Diabetes Research, and what we looked at was cross-reactive foods with um, uh, uh, the target proteins of, of type 1 diabetes. And we were looking at GAT65, uh, 
I ate two uh, islet cells. And what we found was that um, certain foods had molecular mimicry with the cells in the body that produce insulin. So sometimes the, the person you actually think uh, is having a strong glycemic response is having it because they're having an inflammatory response against their pancreas. You definitely want to check to make sure they don't have a subtle uh, autoimmune uh, diabetic pattern. That's called uh, LADA, latent uh, autoimmune disease in adulthood. And most, most of those people get undiagnosed because they just get diagnosed as diabetics. And for those people, if they eat foods that trigger the immune response, they can, they can have some significant reactions. So in the paper we published in Journal of Diabetes Research, we, we discussed um, why looking at the glycemic indexes may not be enough, that you may actually look at food cross-reactivity. So pea protein is a very cross-reactive food with the pancreas. And the, the reasons you may be having significant issues with pea protein is not because of the glycemic response, but more of the immune response that is, that is impacting the pancreas. Okay, next question from Rosemary. Any thoughts on the use of oral supplementation butyrate for those with ileostomize, including removal of the complete colon? Yeah, I think uh, short-chain fatty acids are always a good idea for, for people that have any kind of colon issues, even if they've had some of their colon removed. Um, butyrate, being a short-chain fatty acid, uh, helps control intestinal inflammation and is, it provides a fuel source for the colon to help pr produce more bacteria. It would definitely be something to consider um, for, for uh, ileostomy or any type of removal of your colon uh, just to keep your pH and your colon healthy on a regular basis. Next question, Cindy Williams. What parasite tests, uh, cleansing, I would say, protocol do you recommend? Excuse me. <coughs> well, there's different types of parasite tests out there. Uh, there's the typical parasitology where they look at parasites <coughs> in a um, microscope with different dyes to see if the parasite exists. And there's the more advanced testing, which is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which actually looks for uh, parasitic replication. I like to use both of them. I basically use a panel from a laboratory called... Uh, um, uh, Genova, and they have a GIFX panel, and they look in, and that that panel does both of them. And if they show up with a pathogen, um, then you know you, you, your protocol is based on the pathogen. It's not just a regular cleanse or something. Um, so I don't have the specific protocol for you, but at the end of the day, you know when you're trying to deal with a parasitic infection, you're trying to treat them. You got to make sure the gut is healthy enough before you go into a protocol. And then there are some parasites that have very low responses to natural supplements and they may need uh, prescription medication to help them. And there's some were that they have OVA and you have to treat them for so many weeks, different rounds to get rid of them. So it's parasite specific, it's not, it's not that general. Okay, all right. I have a question from Sarah. Baby weaning suggestions. Mother has CFS RA. When would you induce introduce gluten? I'm not sure if I answer answering your question. As far as baby weaning suggestions, I don't know. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, what? Mother has C. I don't know. I'm sorry, sir. I, I don't want to answer your question. So when would you introduce gluten? Uh, I, I probably. So there's some studies on gluten where they showed that when they have children and they get exposed to gluten proteins in the very first part of life, especially, this is actually specific to celiac disease, and people that have gluten sensitivity genes, when they get exposed to some gluten in early parts of life, they have some degree of immunity um, built against gluten and don't have the significant anti-inflammatory, it's a significant inflammatory reactions later in adulthood. So for example, if someone has the celiac disease genes, um, HLA-DQ2, HLA-DQ8, uh, if those children are initially exposed to some gluten proteins, they tend to have um, less reactions when they get older. Now, there's, there's this, this gets misinterpreted all the time, where then people go, oh, well, I'm going to give my kid gluten all the time because it's healthy for them. No, it can actually totally impact their childhood development, their learning, and so forth. Um, now, I can tell you for us, you know, one of the one of the things that we did as as parents is for our daughter, um, both my wife and I are on a gluten free diet. We've been on it for I don't know how long, twenty something years, before it was trendy. But when we we would expose our daughter to gluten in Europe, 
because the proteins, the, the gluten proteins in Europe are less reactive and they, in, in some countries, don't contain glyphosates, which change the protein structure and reactivity of gluten, which is a theory, but it seems to be accurate with some correlation studies. And we got to expose some, some native gluten proteins um, while we were there, just in her early ages, to then support some of her tolerance. But in the US, we never gave her, uh, we're on a gluten free diet. So um, those are some things to, that was our attempt to translate that information. But you definitely don't want a, a person with a family history of kids with gluten sensitivity to constantly be exposed to gluten no matter what. But there is that one paper that was uh, published on celiac disease patients that early exposure can really calm down the, the inflammatory response in adulthood. Okay. Okay, you know, this, 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 typically with, when you look at research, yeah, there's so many things that are out there and you kind of sometimes get dizzy. Um, you have to try to interpret the best you can. Okay, next question here. Deborah, how bad is antibiotics with autoimmune disease? Well, um, depends what they're being used for. I mean, if you have a bacterial infection, that is something that would be appropriate. Having a bacterial infection can... Um, sometimes trigger the autoimmune disease. Now, the, the key issue with, with antibiotics is that antibiotics will change the flora and change the microbiome. As you have less diversity, you can have less immune dysregulation, and you can have a flare-up. So I would say if you have to take antibiotics, um, you know, when they look at studies of taking probiotics with antibiotics, they actually find that it doesn't get in the way of the antibiotic therapy, and it can be supportive to help the patient recover. So for me, I think if you have to go to antibiotics, you definitely want to consider taking some probiotics. You also want to take some butyrate, which are short-chain fatty acids. That also helps the colon recover much faster if you wipe it out from probiotics. And it provides fuel to the colon so they can regenerate healthy bacteria when it's necessary. And then you want you wanted to basically do what we call the veggie mashup. We talk about that in the immune tolerance program where we take many vegetables and break them all down to... Um, a scooper and water we shake and drink to have a whole list of diverse vegetables to change the microbiome. So I think a veggie mashup with um, butyrate and probiotics may not be a bad idea if you have to take antibiotics for autoimmunity. But uh, you know, there's some patients we see that are antibiotics for like 10, 10 years. I'm not joking, 10, 5, 10 years, 15 years because of treating, trying to treat a chronic Lyme disease or trying to treat a chronic staph infection or something, a strep infection. And uh, it, it, it can really impact their overall health and physiology. So um, it's something that you have to determine if it's appropriate and, and, and go from there. Okay, next question here. Let me try to go to some people that haven't asked questions yet. From Rebecca, why is CBD contraindicated for people with concussion and TBIs? I, that's not contraindicated. I'm not sure where you're hearing that. It could just be a practitioner's recommendation. There are definitely people that have traumatic brain injury that, that the only thing that helps them would be things like CBD um, to really calm down their inflammatory cascade and some of their symptoms. Um, so there is, when you look at, for example, marijuana, there's THC, which is what gets people stoned, and there's CBD, which has the immune modulating uh, properties. So CBD actually dampens brain uh, inflammation. It dampens microglia uh, neuroglia activation of uh, an inflammatory cascade from trauma. So there could be different responses to people that have brain injury. Now, some people that have brain injury um, cannot tolerate THC. They'll, they have significant um, hallucinations and violent attacks and but not violent reactions when they get exposed to THC. But for other people, it's the only way they can really calm down their brain after an injury. So that's the THC portion of it. CBD, for the most part, seems to be beneficial to, to most people with uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, I would never think of it as a contraindication. I would just say that some people that have traumatic brain injuries have various reactions to THC before and after the brain injury. And some get worse, and some it helps them calm down. But, uh, but it's, not a, it's not a clear guideline that they should be not taking CBD. Okay, next question from uh, Surariya. How does B12 impact the brain in regards to focus, concentration, motivation, to stay on task with, some, with something? So B12 helps support a pathway called methylation. And methylation is the transfer of one carbon groups. And methylation is involved with really helping um, uh, different uh, 
inflammatory responses in your brain to work and also it helps with uh, the production of serotonin and B12 also helps with acetylation which is two methyl groups that are used as help to make acetylcholine and that helps with focus and concentration. Now to be honest with you most people that take B12 are not going to notice a difference in their brain function. They're going to take B12 and go I don't notice anything and some people will take B12 and it'll be a small percentage of people and they'll immediately go wow I think and focus and concentrate much better. And that's a huge clinical sign that you may actually need B12. And, uh, you know, so that's one key thing. If you show significant positive benefit to taking B12 in your cognitive task, you definitely want to make sure you measure your serum homocysteine levels, make sure they're not elevated. If your serum homocysteine levels are elevated, you can have significant risk for neurodegenerative diseases and cardiovascular disease. So B12 helps methylation, and if you're not methylating, your homocysteine levels will be high. So uh, those are some uh, clinical pearls I would just share. Next question from Deborah. Dr. K, I have had pernicious anemia and positive antiparietal cell antibodies and intrinsic cell antibodies. My last test, I was negative for both my ANA was still positive. One, one uh, or 80, what does this mean? Do I still have uh, PN? PN. I'm not sure. Okay. So I just wanted, to, I'm not sure if I answer your, understand your question uh, directly, Deborah, but I would just say this. Antibody tests do fluctuate people that have autoimmune disease. Sometimes antibody tests, um, antibody titers will go down as the person goes into remission. And that's a good sign. That means their, auto, their overall immune response to their own tissues has calmed down and the patient feels better. Other times, you can have some regular degree of fluctuation with different antibody markers. Doesn't mean you're getting better or worse. So you, you get to, you know, you got to look at these levels. So, for example, if you're looking at um, something like TPO antibodies for the thyroid, and let's say the range is less than 45 is normal, someone comes in with an antibody of 220, and then they retest it and it's 250. That's not, that's not that big of a deal. That's kind of about the same. There's some degree of just normal variation. But if they go from, let's say, 220 down to 20, that's probably remission, or it looks like the antibodies are coming down, maybe positive. But if they also go from 20 to 1,000, that could be a degree of a flare-up. So antibodies you know, will change and fluctuate as a normal part of autoimmunity. There's also some people that, that have a false response, um, which means uh, they'll, they'll have antibody levels drop, but they're actually getting much, much worse. And what you see with them is they have their autoimmune disease, but their total white blood cell count um, starts to drop and they're getting so immune compromised that their immune system is getting so fatigued that they're not able to make as many antibodies and you see that their B cell count their CD19 markers percentages actually drop and they may look like they're getting better because their antibody levels are going down but they're actually getting much much worse so you also you also see that as well okay um, let me just take one last question and then we can uh, you know, we'll meet up on another day. Is it possible to take too much fish oil supplement? It's possible to take too much fish oils. So whenever you take fish oils, um, so well, let me say a few things about fish oils. When you look at fish oils, you know, they used to think like taking a thousand or two thousand milligrams is sufficient. And if you look at a fish oil capsule, most of the fish oil capsules you'll see that are manufactured have about a thousand milligrams um, in them. And new research has come out over the years where they show, well, maybe 1,000 milligrams isn't, the, isn't, isn't enough. So 10 to 15,000 milligrams have been recommended for controlling inflammation and supporting the brain. And some people really do need the higher dose, uh, 10,000 milligrams of fish oils a day. The problem with fish oils is that they do have a blood thinning effect. So they're definitely contraindicated with anyone that has on, on any kind of anticoagulants. Um, you definitely don't want to be taking fish oils. And for anyone who's got some susceptibility to having a blood thinning effect, you know, taking high amounts of fish oils is not a good idea. Um, and then for some people that have subtle gallbladder issues, when they start really increasing their fish oil intake, their, their digestion shuts down. They get bloated, distended, they don't feel well. Um, and that's a sign that the gallbladder needs to be treated and managed. And, and then, and, but there are some people who, who just can't tolerate as much fish oil supplements. Anyways, um, I think we went about an hour and a half into, into the discussion. We'll absolutely have more of these. Uh, thank you all for joining from all over the world. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. 
Um, I was just doing the best I can. They, they just keep coming in. I'm trying to read in the, the best I can. I hope you, you found this, uh, um, this live f uh, feed uh, useful and looking forward to um, doing this again with everyone soon. Thanks again for joining.